Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Um, it's a pleasure to see um, a lot of familiar faces and also to hear um, familiar voices as well. Um, I've always um, had the pleasure to um, engage and also, um, you know, work alongside you um, in, in this space uh, on sexual and gender-based violence. Welcome on board. Um, it's two o'clock in Samoa, um, so it's the afternoon and I wish uh, everyone a good morning. Um, and um, I hope that you you will continue to join Pilon and its, uh, and its webinars in the future. Uh, we might as well make a start now as um, we roll up because we only don't have um, much time. We've only got less than an hour and a half at the moment. Mm -hmm. And um, so good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Um, Talo falava. Um, we have called this webinar Working Together to Implement the Regional um, Guidelines. And many of you know that the regional guidelines themselves are a great example of what we can achieve when we work together. So the guidelines set out best practice guidance for communicating to minimize trauma and supporting vulnerable witnesses from time to time. And also from time the prosecution first receives the files until onward referral to support services upon conclusion of the prosecution process. And these were drafted by a dedicated group of experienced prosecutors and witness support officers. And we call this group the advisory panel. Two representatives from the advisory panel will be our webinar presenters today. They are Paula Masawakalo from Vanuatu and Letiara Peli from the Samona Islands. We're also um, happy to um, inform you that we also have Kati Wase, um, the Chief Prosecutor of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, who will speak on areas um, the Marshall Islands had identified that focus should be placed on as members roll out the implementation of the regional guideline. And I look forward to introducing them shortly. After that, we also had another member of the advisory panel. She is Helen Bennett. Um, she is the witness support officer for the Solomon Islands, who will also be providing some answers and assisting Letiara with, um, you know, with any questions um, that will be raised by members at the end of their presentation. Um, so just a brief outline. In March of this year, many of you participated in our three-day workshop in Fiji. And during the workshop, you received training on the necessary skills to implement the regional guideline. You also developed plans for implementing them in your jurisdiction. We discussed how to monitor and evaluate the impact of the guideline. And we know that many of you left the workshop feeling very motivated to implement these guidelines in your jurisdiction. We know that we all work together in a very extremely uh, busy offices. You know, that's a fact. And we don't always have time to think about how to use these new processes. So PILON has been trying to collect data on how the implementation plans are progressing. And we thank those of you that completed the questionnaire and also contacted the PILON secretariat to provide feedback. I really encourage you to complete these questionnaire and to participate in the discussion today so we have a better idea of how to target our activities and trainings to your needs. Originally, we were planning to focus on monitoring and evaluation in this webinar. However, when we looked at the feedback from the questionnaires that were sent to us, we realized that many of you still require some extra assistance to get started. So we want to know whether the regional guidelines are having the intended uh, impact. And that's what we really want to know. And we had a number of sessions on this topic at the regional guidelines implementation workshop. And we will continue to focus on monitoring and evaluation, preferably next year. That is why we decided that in today's webinar, our presenters will discuss how they adopted and adapted the regional guideline to their circumstances, as well as they have uh, how they are monitoring and evaluating their impact. So today, before we start our presentation today, I'm very pleased to announce a new mentoring pilot we will be running. And this pilot is a process where the advisory panel members will use their experience and expertise to provide encouragement, advice, and support to other sexual and gender-based violence working group members, counterpart, so they can grow and develop not just the skills, but also the processes for implementing the regional guideline. The goal of our mentoring pilot is not to instruct, but rather to provide support 
and guide the mentored counterparts' own efforts to apply their knowledge and skills to real situations in their jurisdictions and apply best practice and experiences shared by the advisory panel members. All our peer law and sexual and gender-based violence members, working group members, are eligible to participate. And the mentorship uh, program is specifically targeted at those who haven't started implementing the original guideline or are experiencing any uh, implementation um, challenges. Um, how this will work is the secretariat will be the administrator of the pilot. And to register, please email the secretariat and we will schedule a calendar of virtual meetings with the advisory panel and you. The meeting will be the opportunity for you to explain your jurisdiction circumstances and also the opportunity for you to ask the advisory panel for, for advice. So during our first virtual mentorship uh, meeting, the panel members will provide initial advice and together you can agree on an estimated time and plan for engagement. I welcome you to email our secretariat if you are interested in being involved in this mentoring program. Now introducing our presenters, without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce our first webinar presenter from Vanuatu, the Office of Public Prosecution, Ms. Paula Masalvakalo. Paula is Vanuatu's first victim support officer. She has been in her role for three years, 11 months and counting. Paula will be discussing her role, providing professional assistance and emotional support to witnesses and victims of crime. She will also share how being an advisory panel member has helped her grow. Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Chair. Um, hi, everyone. So um, if, you've, if you attended the workshop in uh, Fiji in March, you probably would have met me. For those who haven't, um, hello, my name is Paula. Um, I am the Victim Support Officer here at the Office of the Public Prosecutor of Vanuatu. Uh, just a brief background um, uh, on myself. I graduated with, uh, I, got, I graduated doing my bachelor, um, majoring in psychology and social work in 2020. And I started work here um, October, 2020. You probably might even uh, ask the question why victim support is in prosecution and not in other agency. Uh, this is it's, the reason is being um, the Office of the Public Prosecutor has an obligation to victims of crime, and that is reflected in the Public Prosecutor Act, Prosecution and Guideline, um, OPP Victims of Crime Charter, and other relevant legislation and policy that safeguards the interests and rights of victims. I um, just wanted to touch a little bit on the uh, uh, OPP Victims Charter to so some of the rights. Uh, it's important for um, the officers, including myself, to understand those rights so that when we're working with victims of crime, um, we, we treat them with uh, compassion, respect, uh, dignity, um, and privacy that responds to their needs. Um, they have the right to compensation and reparation, uh, the right to protection from violence and intimidation, uh, the right to offer information to participate in criminal justice, proceedings if necessary and wherever possible. And also the right to information and to be informed um, of the status of the case. So my role uh, as a victim support officer is to assist the public prosecutor and its officials, um, assist the victims of crime when they're coming through the process. So um, my job is to provide information in relation to court processes um, we've just recently had a, a chat, I'm just going to show, that has the flow of the, uh, how after a lot has been, um, complaint has been lodged in the police, we just had that, so it, it helps when we are explaining uh, the victims uh, what happens after they have lodged a complaint uh, with the police and the process that the case follows up until it comes to the Office of the Public Prosecutor and the stages it takes as well um, here at the OPP Vanuatu. 
Uh, I also arrange and facilitate counseling where necessary to help victims through the prosecution process so they're able to move on in, in a positive way. Um, keep an updated personal information and data about victims and their families for communication and prosecution purposes. Um, so um, this is sort of like uh, reintegration back to society in a way that they're able to move on in a positive way. Um, I mentioned the uh, updated personal information and data about victims. Uh, for instance, um, the use of procedural template on the regional guideline on page 36, uh, where it says the record of contact template. So whenever you have sessions with victims, be sure to keep a record of it because sometimes during the official lodge of complaint to the police, uh, they might they may not have recalled everything, but uh, but as time passes, some sometimes um, they remember and they miss something that they should have said to the police. And then during the first meet and greet, um, they probably uh, remember and would tell you during uh, your session with them. So you just wanna make note of that and then inform the prosecutor in carriage of the case, just in case those information are relevant to assist with their case. Um, discuss questions and concern, concerns that victims may have. I also attend court whenever uh, requested by a prosecutor or victim for moral and emotional support. Um, also arrange visit to court for victims in order to become familiar with the environment. Uh, this is uh, often for vulnerable witness like uh, children in particular, uh, as well as uh, victims that are from the other islands of uh, Efate. Um, but they've never been to Port Vila, they've never been to court. It's part of my uh, role as a victim support to take them, to, to show them the, uh, the court setting and tell them where they were sitting and, and stuff like that. Um, as well as to update them on the status of the case. So part of arranging, making arrangement to court visit is so that it, it can also assist when um, um, there are special measures in, measures in court. So when you're visiting, sometimes during then, then the victim will inform you that um, if you tell them that the defendant will be sitting right across and they'll be looking at them and they can inform you right there and then that they're not comfortable with that. If it's okay, this, if there's anything that can be done to, um, so they don't have to see the defendant while they're giving their evidence. So as part of your roles, my role as a victim support is to advocate and to inform the prosecutor and carry it that the victim may not have the confidence or to lessen the intimidation. I think it's best that you, as the prosecutor, make necessary application to court to ask for screening and as well as for close court. Um, updating uh, victims on the status of the case is a very, very important part of my role as a victim support because uh, when they are not left in the dark, they are updated on the status of the case. It, it helps their cooperation in, in a way up until to the very end. And it would also minimize um, withdrawals uh, of cases where they withdraw, they write a letter to us that they withdraw from a case. So when we keep them updated, when we um, inform them of the status of the case, it, it makes them feel uh, we are giving them a voice, their voice is being heard in, in a way, and also they feel part, they feel like uh, we are truly genuinely do care for them and we want the best for them because we do act in the best interest of the victims. Um, uh, what, I, what I do not do, that's not part of my role, uh, is uh, I don't take the place of the prosecutor. Um, for instance, explaining why a case is being withdrawn or is going ahead despite a withdrawal letter, uh, withdrawal request, that's a uh, prosecutor's um, a place to explain in case there are some uh, legality of it. The prosecutor is the one that explains that. Um, I don't provide counseling to victims of, uh, or victims of crime or witnesses. 
but victim support acts as a referral point to relevant stakeholders who do provide that support. For instance, uh, the Vanuatu Women's Center uh, or Mind Care Unit at the Phila Central Hospital, both uh, government and non-government. Uh, victim support does not represent the victims or witnesses, and uh, we don't uh, influence prosecution decisions or legal outcomes. Okay, so what works for us in relation to the regional guidelines? Because victim support is a uh, part of prosecution, so much of the information inside the regional guideline is already um, a part of the service of uh, victim support inside prosecution. Uh, our only take on would be on the vulnerable risk assessment. Um, uh, the, the, the vulnerable risk assessment, it's, it's an important tool to consider for court process, for court processes, because it, it adds some sort of standard when making an application to oppose bail. Um, it gives, uh, it gives you a prosecutor or a witness support officer a bird's eye view of the circumstances surrounding the victim because at that point in time, their safety is very important. Um, so, so for instance, I'll take a scenario of a domestic violence um, case. So for instance, um, assessment has been made on the first impression uh, of the police brief. Uh, on the victim of the domestic of domestic violence, but then you are aware that children are being involved as, um, and then as per the tally, uh, from uh, the the risk may be low from a zero to nine. So when you tally the scores, it says seven, but because um, children are involved, so the additional part of the uh, vulnerable risk assessment where it says any additional information you wish to add, that's the part where you can recommend, make recommendations stating that in all the, although the risk is low, but because children are involved, all safety measures have to be in place to ensure their safety. So that would be a uh, um, take on for us on the regional guideline. Uh, on the vulnerability on the vulnerability risk assessment. In terms of challenges, um, I only have two. Um, one of one the first challenges uh, for us here um, would be the accessibility of the service. As we understand that the further we go out, the lesser the, the resources are. Uh, we have an office in Santo and another office in Tana, and no victim support or witness support officer is, is present. Um, and the second part, uh, uh, part of the challenge is uh, being able to incorporate uh, part of the regional guideline, exactly, uh, example, the vulnerability risk assessment uh, to be in, uh, Integral, integrated, integrated process, part of the process, and see where best to use the vulnerable risk assessment, whether a prosecutor does it on the first in, impression of the police brief and being mindful you know, of their workload, or during the first meet and greet uh, when, uh, with a victim support or witness support officer. Um, so um, I think those are the only two challenges uh, for us here. And I um, I think the I think that would be all from my end. But before I finish and give it back to our chair, I would just like to um, I encourage um, other victims, uh, witness support officers out there, or if you actually if you're not, but you uh, also also assisting the police or prosecution uh, victims of crime. Whatever, whatever agency you're at and um, uh, displaying or performing that uh, duty responsibility, uh, I'd like to just say that uh, your role is integral in, integral in ensuring that the process is not just about legal proceedings, 
but about human dignity and respect. Your compassion makes a difference and your commitment to standing by those in need of support is testament to the very best of humanity. May you always be reminded of the incredible impact you have on the lives of those you serve. Uh, so that would be all from my end. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I give it back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Wow. Um, thank you for your presentation and also highlighting your role as a witness support officer. And I believe as um, RMI also joining, especially, and also everybody else joining, um, you know, they've really been touched by your compassion on the work that you do. Thank you again. Um, our second presentation today is from the Solomon Islands and uh, the off from the Solomon Islands, our Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. We have Letiara Peli from the Solomon Islands. She is the Principal Legal Officer in the Family and Sexual Offenses Unit. And she is joined by Helen Bennett, the Witness Support Liaison Officer in their office. Solomon Islands have been leaders in this work and our regional guidelines are based on the Solomon Islands guideline, which were implemented in 2021. So in June this year, a review was conducted in the Solomon Islands of their guidelines. And today, Letiara will share the outcomes of that review. Um, Letiara will present for 20 minutes and we will ask uh, for questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Letiara. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, for the introduction. Um, hello, Olketa from Solomon Island. Uh, I'm pleased to share with you some of the experiences and the practices that we do here in the Solomon Islands, especially on how we implement our internal policy guidelines um, to support witnesses and also the regional guidelines. And as the uh, Chair also mentioned, I will also briefly share with you our experience and the outcomes in our review that we did in June. So you might all ask, how did the Solomon Islands uh, implement the practices uh, outlined in the regional guideline? Or where do we start? Now, instead of me telling you um, what we do, the pro practices that we do here in the office, I will be sharing with you a short video. And this video basically summarizes the process and the standard practice that we currently have in place in our office that shows how we implement the practices um, outlined in our internal guideline as well as the original guideline. Thank you, Chase. When a case file is received and registered into our case management system, the senior typist enters the details of the accused and complainant and assigns a registered number to the case file. The case file is then given to the practice manager who assesses the police brief for the level of complexity and renders a recommendation to the DPP for an allocated prosecutor. Once a prosecutor receives a new case file, she or he will read the police brief and make a first assessment of the evidence and information about the complainant. She would then fill in the witness vulnerability risk assessment form by checking off applicable categories to determine the level of vulnerability of the complainant. Any special needs of the complainant will be noted for the attention of the witness support officer. After the file is assessed by the prosecutor, she instructs the witness support officer to schedule a first meet and greet session with the complainant and his or her guardian. The witness support officer has her own case management system to keep records of scheduled meetings for each case. On a first meet and greet session, the witness support officer and the prosecutor builds report with the complainant. They explain the court process and the special measures available to help them to give their evidence. A child-friendly environment helps to create a safe, warm and comfortable space where the complainants can feel free to express themselves. It is also an opportunity for the witness support officer and the prosecutor to speak to the parent or guardian about the no job policy and offer information on service providers to support them before going through the court process. In the pre-trial stage, the prosecutor will make the appropriate application under the Evidence Act for special measures to be available to the complainant in the trial. 
Some of the measures include a support person, an audiovisual link arrangement, screening of the accused, closed court, or suppression of names. So um, that is basically the process or the practice that we have in place in the office. Uh, we basically incorporate the practices in the guideline into our existing process from the registration of a new file um, and to when it is allocated to a prosecutor and up, up until the hearing stage. So we include what the practices in the guideline into our um, process um, within the office. Um, yes. So since the launching of our internal guideline in July of 2021, almost three years after, in June of this year, we reviewed our internal guideline and the process and the practices that we have. And from the review, we identified some challenges and we come up with some resolution to strengthen um, the practices or the existing practices that we have. So one of the area that we look um, at during the, our review is our internal vulnerability risk assessment. Um, during the review, we looked at um, the form and we received feedbacks from prosecutors who filled in the forms and they find it very useful when they fill in the form at the first initial stage when they receive the file. And some of the um, feedbacks is that uh, it helps to assess the risk the complainant is facing and the type of service that needed for the safety and well-being of a victim. It also helps to assess challenges that prosecutors will face uh, during the trial process. From the review, we identified some challenges. Um, some prosecutors identified that the main reason for not um, completing the internal vulnerability risk assessment is because some, they do not know how to use it. Some say that it's time consuming, other stages forgot. So during the review, we gave the participants um, two versions of the witness vulnerability risk assessment. So we have our internal one and we have the regional one. So we gave them um, both versions and we asked them to fill both of those versions based on a case study. And they were asked to identify the positives and the negatives of the both um, assessment. And when comparing, um, When comparing the two versions, it was noted that the ODPP vulnerability risk assessment contains broad options and criteria that requires prosecutors to analyze the complainant situation and circumstances. And in contrast, the participant noted that the original guideline um, version was clear, easy to follow, and more user-friendly. So therefore, we come up with a resolution to tailor our internal vulnerable risk assessment and the regional one to better capture some of the factors that we discussed during the review that is um, relevant to our context uh, here in um, Solomon Islands. And some of these factors, um, for example, access to weapon or influential perpetrators, uh, ability for witness to remember, um, language, relationship status. Um, those are some factors that we think that we should, when we tailor um, the, the, uh, the vulnerable risk assessment, we would like to include them in as well. Um, so that's um, one way that we, one of the resolutions that we come up with to, to improve um, the um, vulnerable risk assessment, our internal one. Also to address the issue of that some prosecutors mentioned that, you know, not, for not filling up the forms, we decided that um, the our witness support officers um, can assist by filling in the forms, uh, the vulnerable risk assessment. So before the file um, is given to the prosecutor, it goes first to the witness support officers who will fill in the vulnerable risk assessment. And based on that um, risk assessment, they will set up a first meet and greet before giving the file um, to the prosecutor. Or sometimes if the prosecutor already received the file, he or she can ask the witness support officer to help you know, fill in the forms if they're too busy. 
So that's how the practice that we do, you know, to, to ensure that we implement and we fill in the forms. And um, normally the first meet and greet is set um, according to the level of vulnerability of the witness. So if we see that the, um, the complainant is a child, we will definitely set the first meet and greet as soon as possible um, without having to wait. Um, so uh, the witness support officer, Helen Bennett, um, normally uh, do that um, in practice here. So uh, another area that we look at during the review is the first meet and greet. Um, as you can see in the slide, that is uh, the picture shows our child-friendly room that we have in the office. And we conduct our first meet and greet or conferencing of vulnerable witnesses in that room. And that is also one way that you know we implement the practices in the guideline by creating a safe space in the office, um, inside our office to you know accommodate um, our witnesses. And that's also one simple way that you can do to start off uh, by implementing the, the guideline. And um, from the review, the overwhelming response from the prosecutors was that holding a first meet and greet was very useful. Parents and complainants understand court proceedings, the issue of compensation in relation to court and the purpose of no drug policy, and also opportunity to you know, build a report with the um, complainant at the um, first instant. And also referrals were also made. Um, offered as well during the first meet and greet. And the practice after um, the first meet and greet is that normally after we had our first meet and greet, the prosecutor and the witness support officer will then go back to the vulnerable risk assessment that was filled in at the first instance just by reading through the file, will then reassess. We will reassess that vulnerable risk assessment and make further notes if it's all we find out during the first meet and greet that this, this problem happened or this, and I will make that down uh, in the comment section in that form. So that's what we do in practice after a first meet and greet. We reassess the vulnerable risk assessment. And sometimes, um, and at, it, at that time, if we note that there's a need for a second meet and greet, based on that reassessment, we will then set up another second meet and greet, depending on um, how the assessment is like after the first meet and greet. So that's the practice um, that we have uh, in place here. Um, also, we identified um, challenges in relation to first meet and greet. Now, from the review, one of the challenges identified is that location of witnesses raise difficulty, especially when witnesses are located in remote parts of the province. So we cannot do that when witnesses are outside in the province. So we find that it is more uh, practicable to do first meet and greet in person when witnesses are you know, close by or in town um, areas. So we to address this issue, we come up with the production of an introductory video for child witnesses. Um, it is now underway. And the child introductory video basically captures the practice and the relevant information that witnesses and parents and guidance that um, they need to know during the first meet and greet. Example, um, you know, compensation, court processes, we include that inside the um, video. And so the video will be used in the provinces or areas that we cannot go and do our first meet and greet. And we'll be doing a, conducting a trainings for police officers and other support services or NGOs who will assist us on how to use the video as well. So um, that is also one of the resolutions that we'll do to improve um, the challenges that we've um, um, identified after you know um, the practices uh, implementing the guideline. Now, we also look at special measures as well during the review, and we note from the review that um, prosecutors indicated confidence in making applications for special measures, and which is um, really good. Um, one of the challenges um, that 
we discussed during the review is we currently only have one female um, witness support officer. So like when there's two trials running and the complainant wanted the support person, who do we turn to? So what we do now is that if the witness support officer is is not available, we use our female admin staff and she will go and sit in a support person. And also we also engage our counselors from our other support services now. After the review, we had one that come in to assist and sit in as a support person uh, during trials. So um, with those um, issues, we you know use our admin, female admin staff, as well as in the province, because we don't have witness support officers in our provincial office. So we use our admin staff in the province to you know step in. And we have Helen Bennett. Uh, conducting trainings for them, you know, on how to fill in the risk assessment and, um, you know, sitting during first meeting, greet and conferencing. We have uh, uh, Helen conducting trainings um, for our admin staff as well. And now they're doing it and it worked really well and it helps uh, Helen as well. Um, one of the challenges as well is, you know, um, lack of a special measures kit because uh, in the provincial office and also during seconds. So now one of the resolution is that we will be creating special measures kit so that prosecutors when going out for second will just bring with them and make application and use those um, kits to uh, during trials and all that. Yeah, so that's um, regarding the special measures and also um, the final area that we looked at during the review is the victim um, impact statement. So briefly, um, sorry, the victim impact statement. A majority of prosecutors found the use of victim impact statement at sentence very useful. Even judges and magistrates um, refer to these victim impact statements in their sentences as well when they um, pass the sentence. So this really shows, you know, the impact of, you know, having to, the need to fill in a victim impact statement um, when the case is at the sentence stage. Um, some of the main reason why um, victim impact statement was done, um, prosecutors forgot sometimes cases were completed on seconds and victims were not present and sometimes victim was not present at the time of sentencing. So one of the resolutions we um, came up with is, you know, to organize training for police and other support services on, you know, completing the victim impact statement at either at when the uh, in investigation stays or when prosecutors or um, the witness support um, officer is not there. So um, that's one of the resolution also we come up with. So um, briefly, that is the practice we have in place in our office um, to implement the practices in our um, internal guideline and the regional guideline to support our vulnerable witnesses here in Solomon Islands, uh, mainly in relation to sexual offenses. Uh, maybe some of the practices um, we have here can also, you know, be applied in your jurisdiction. Um, I just like I would like to encourage you all to start adapting the guideline and and their practices and contextualize it like how we do it here in in Solomon Island. Because um, if we can do it, you can do it as well. At least we start somewhere. So um, thank you so much. Um, that's all from me, Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Letiara, um, for that very interesting, useful, and enlightening um, presentation. Thank you for the use of the videos, the templates, um, you know, and all that. It really sets a pace on the processes that's involved in, in our guideline as well. Um, the outcomes of your review is very useful for us, and we welcome more discussions and, and even conversations on your best practice um, that we can perhaps um, share. Um, and for the last part of our um, webinar, I would like to introduce um, Mr. Kati Wase, the Chief Prosecutor of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, um, who will guide us on the specific areas um, Marshall Islands has identified that focus should be placed on as they roll out their implementation of the guideline. The floor is yours, um, Kati. Um, good afternoon to you all. Uh, it's afternoon here in RMI, of course. Uh, um, Yahweh, 
Feeding of Ziyogui from RMI. Uh, it's an honor to be on this call. Thank you, Society Alone, again, for this opportunity to share uh, where we are with respect to the implementation of uh, the original guidelines. Uh, by way of introduction, again, my name is Kati Waze. I am an assistant attorney general with the Office of the Attorney General, also the, the uh, chief prosecutor, head of the criminal divisions of the attorney generals for two years now, since 2022, and over five years as a prosecutor. Uh, there are currently five prosecutors within my criminal division, our division of criminal, uh, and our primary role is to prosecute crimes committed against the Republic under the Criminal Code and also the Domestic Violence Act. And that includes sexual and gender-based violence and violations. Uh, um, <clears throat> as someone who have worked with victims of domestic violence and sexual assault for some years now, I'm very, very pleased, grateful to belong and to all the experienced uh, prosecutors, social workers who put together this great piece uh, together, great piece together, the regional guidelines. I'm very impressed, very happy that I know, uh, having reviewed it, uh, I've seen that um, though not all of it may be relevant, applicable here in the RMI, uh, I'm very grateful because some of them, we were, I mean, they're new to us and we're gonna, we're very optimistic we look forward and we hope to implement and adopt them as part of our, our law, our rules to help us uh, effectively combat uh, this violence against women. Um, the question that came to RMI is how, where we are with this uh, implementation and that is what I will do here and, and share um, our, I would say, tentative plan and again, this is a only a tentative plan. Uh, we are very, we are at the very early stage of implementing uh, these regional guidelines. As you all know, my uh, colleague who, who was also part of this team that put this together, uh, Ms. Abuna Tagabebe is no longer with us. She has resigned, she's now in Kiribati. I'm very grateful for what she has done and for sharing this with you. Um, Again, uh, going back to the questions, uh, RMI is at this very early stage of the implementation. And what I mean by that is we are still uh, contemplating how we should move forward or what is what are the first steps that we should take. And, um, and I believe the reason why we're part of this uh, call, it's not because we are ahead of everybody, but we are the beginning and we, we want to hear your your story, uh, and based on our also our our the challenges that we face here in RMI, I must say that uh, in addition to uh, the uh, prosecutors, our criminal division who prosecute the crimes, we also have uh, we also have uh, the social group called With Me, and also the the domestic violence unit within the Marshall Island Police Department and also the local police department who have been very uh, helpful, uh, have been helping us with this work. Um, now coming back, going back, um, so the, the challenges, uh, I'm sorry, let me share our tentative plan. So what we agreed on is, is the first step would be to, and again, I'm sharing this from someone who, who is learning, and I would appreciate your feedback, your 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 ideas. If if it works, if not, I would hear. I would love to hear from you. Um, so what we have in mind is to it's to form a group, a task force, and and the reason being is because uh, we've seen that it work in other area like human trafficking, and. And that's the reason why we want to form a task force that is comprised a, com a comprised of the relevant uh, stakeholder, and that would be our office, the Attorney Generals of the RMI, uh, with me. That is the social group, 
and as well as the domestic violence unit within the Marshall Island Police Department and and the local police department to get, and also the uh, human services uh, department, the mental health uh, workers, uh, the doctor for mental health. Um, so that is that is the that is the plan is is and and, and to call this group to meet and. And the point is to have everyone review the regional plan and see uh, which one is relevant, which one is not, which one will work for us here in RMI, as well as to each of the uh, the, the, the the stakeholders. And whatever work, we will be combining it together into another piece and share it with the government and have them endorse it and their support. And um, that is the plan again for now. Um, and we're looking forward to to have that uh, very soon, uh, as soon as we get the green light to to make the call uh, to organize this meeting. So again, like I said, uh, we're at the early stage of implementation, and and. We would love to hear from you and how what's worked for you. Uh, the challenges, um, of course, uh, there there were there are some uh, there are some measures within the regional uh, guidelines that are already existed here in RMI, but I will share what with the challenges we have here. And one would be the uh, the no trap policy. Of course, is there. However, we continue to receive a number, great number of cases being dropped before they reach, uh, they're reported to our office, the criminal division. And so most of the time we don't, and these are the cases of, of uh, domestic violence. Uh, it's not the same as for sexual assault cases because uh, we don't have issue with that, but it's just for the uh, domestic, like assault within family members by a partner or uh, family members. So that is what we, we continue to, to face here in RMI. A uh, great number of domestic violence being dropped or withdrawn before it reached our office. Uh, the second issue with it would be the, uh, I would, I think I shared this already, is um, we don't have like you have in the Solomon Islands, uh, in the Vanuatu, I believe, you have a social worker that is specifically working with uh, with the Attorney General's office. We don't have that guy. And we only have uh, Woodemi, who is an NGO that have their own priorities. And most of the time, we don't uh, we don't they're not available for assistance. Um, and the Th that's another issue we have here. Uh, with respect to with me also having uh, worked with them, uh, I have come to learn that uh, the issue they faced, and especially with respect to a uh, minor victim, because we really need help, uh, um, advisor or counselor who can help us uh, with minor victims of sexual assault or domestic violence, and with me as well as. There is another office, the Child Rights Office, that is within our Internal Affairs Ministry of Internal Affairs. Affairs, uh, both both of these offices are not willing. Not, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, I have informed us that uh, most of the time that they they cannot assist us, and reason being is because they're not certified. And I'm trying, still trying to understand the the reason behind that because. As I have heard from other colleagues from other regional, that you don't need to be certified. But um, maybe that is something that we also want to to share with you, and also need your advice, your share your your ideas on how we can uh, overcome these kind of issues. And um, I think I think these are the two issues we have. Um, and I also want to hear more about how we can uh, move forward, the way forward with respect to the implementation of the uh, regional guidelines. 
um i believe that's that's how we i have for you today and i i i love to hear from you too thank you very much uh Sasai. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Kati, um, for that very long, um, <laughs> that was, uh, was very interesting to hear. And thank you again for um, making yourself available to, um, to come one of our presenters today. I'll give the floor to Letty and Helen and also Paula. Would you like to provide um, some insight to some of the issues that Kati was raising? We also have a question also um, that's been raised by the assistant AG Sose, who's also sitting in and listening in at the moment. But um, um, Paula, do you want, or Letty, would you like to go first? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'll ask Helen to um, share our experience or practice, you know, when um, in relation to, you know, social welfare and all that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you. Um, when you speak about um, social welfare worker, so um, the support person gives support to the child, to the child. You don't need to be certified to do that. And it, it depends on what assistance you require. That's how, if, if you need, if the child needs a psychiatric, you refer to them and they can come and sit, sit in the court with them or a counselor, an NGO can do that. But usually if I'm not around, a normal admin officer can come and do the work, can come and sit with the witness in the court or whatever you ask the support person to do. That's how we deal with our support people. Thank you. Paula, do you want to add on to that? Um, yeah, yes, uh, Chair. Um, so uh, how Vanuatu uh, prosecution here does it is, before I understand that before victim support came into um, establishment, um, I've had um, there were some staff, some of the prosecutors that have already that have informed me that um, before that they they used to um, involved uh, other service providers who work in that uh, space. Uh, like here, they have the Vanuatu Women's Center. They have the the mind care, and sometimes if they are not available, they would ask one of the female colleagues, one of the female prosecutors who is available, and that just, and I think that I think the important thing is to, if you if you see that um, they they have that, um, they are kind perhaps in nature and don't show like uh, they're mean or something because usually the vulnerable. Especially children are sort of when you when you're walking towards them and your um just the, the demeanor, I I think, but being kind, uh speaking to them in a very low tone, uh having um showing a smile when you're walking in, that sort of sort of helped them and uh allows for you to sit in with them and as the prosecutor is talking to them, they would like for you someone like that or that sort of um character or displays the sort of uh, um, behavior around them just to be comfortable to sit in, in with them when the prosecutor is talking uh, to them. So I, yeah, it, you don't really need someone certified to my experience to, if they're, they're, not, not, they're not available at that time, but you really do need someone, uh, you can uh, um, use your uh, female staff who are available and you see that they're really good with children or just have a kind um, nature, uh, you can involve them um, as well to sit in and assist you. Um, I, yes, that's, uh, that's, that's how I, I was being informed before victim support came in. And now the victim support is in, um, in service. I work, uh, it's my, uh, like I think I already mentioned during the workshop in um, Fiji, I stated that uh, when I started, it's it's my role to um, 
build that relationship with other relevant stakeholders who work in that space. Is my role is to understand what sort of service they provide in case I need to use their support. So even as a victim support officer or witness support officer, uh, you even have a role to play. It's very important for you to take that initiative and, and do that, you know, do that extra, extra little bit just so you have that um, connection with those agencies so that if you are unable to attend court at the same time when there's a, you are needed elsewhere, you can reach out to them and they will be able to assist you because you already have that, you build that rapport with them as well and you have a, a relationship with those other agencies. So everybody's working together. And so when you reach out, it's very easy and uh, they'll be uh, quick to assist you. Um, uh, yes, I hope that's, uh, uh, that will help you in a way. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mm. Thank you, Paula. Um, I have a question here that was given to me by the Assistant Attorney General Samoa. Um, she's uh, so sick. Um, she's just asking um, the Solomon Islands. She said, um, "Can you know?" She would like to know of how easy it is to use the admin officers to sit in and assist the vulnerable witnesses. And and I think Paula just asked, just answered some part of it. But I think they wanted to know that how easy is it? You know, you can just call them, or do you roster them, or just in case um, the witness support officer is not available. Mm. And what if um, that means if you roster them, if you roster them, do you roster them knowing that these are good, kind admin officers who are not mean or have that didn't yeah over to you Letty <laughs> um, yes uh, thank you for that question um so yes we use our, our admins um offices um especially when Helen is not available so when we know that Helen will not be available she will let us know or I will not be available um, for the first meet and greet so that's when we'll go. Um, we have um, a number of female admin staff here. So we'll invite one of them to come and sit in during the first meeting so that she can meet the, the complainant at that time so that, you know, they don't go to court and then see, oh, a different face. Uh, she saw Helen in the first meeting grid, but then during the court, another person comes. So we always inform our, our complainants, especially first meeting grid, we'll <coughs> introduce our admin officer. If Helen Bennett was present during the first meeting and then during trial, she's not available, we'll, we'll have to introduce the admin staff first to the complainant again and inform her. She, uh, she will be sitting in with you during the um, trial. She will just be there to provide you support, you know, so that um, the witness is, you know, um, get to know the admin um, officer first before going to court. So. Um, we have our, our, our famous admin um, staff here, they are um, kind, they they don't look scary, so uh, <laughs> so it's easy, uh, you know, just to um, have them uh, assist Helen as well um, uh, to sit in during conferencing or like that. So we uh, do not have any um, challenge or problem, um, you know, victim um, not wanting us the admin staff to sit in, they welcome them. So sometimes we must ask them first, do you want her to sit in? And if she said no, okay, we'll excuse her. But if she said yes, then um, we'll allow her. We always ask what the the the, the complainant wants uh, before, um, you know, doing that. Um, Helen? Yeah, and I will add to what Letira uh, mentioned. And we, we have an MOU with an NGO a counseling agent agency. So recently we had one child witness, one child complaining that that wants the counselor to sit with her in the court. So we go with what the child wants. And yeah. And also the social welfare department, we we use them too. And Sometimes we use family members that are no, not witnesses. And they, yeah. 
the aunt or the grandmother, they can sit with them in court and they feel comfortable with them. Thank you. I have one question that's be also been ans asked here. We want to ask, um, I think it also relates to what um, Kati Wase was um, speaking on. How much assistance do you give to the witness to in the event that it might come out like the defense counsel might say you're coaching them you know how how much <laughs> yeah I mean I don't know the I think I you know what I'm yeah I think it was reflected first when Kati mentioned you know about having those stakeholders to make sure the process uh, yeah yeah, so um, during the first meet and greet, we don't normally talk about the evidence, um, you know, telling them or uh, talk to them about the evidence of um, what the story is. We basically, it's just an opportunity to introduce us and then talk about the um, processes and all that. Um, it's during the pre-hearing phase, um, preparing for trial, and we conference the witness. We normally um, just ask them, you know, normally the conferencing time, we just tell them you have to tell your story, the same story told the police, speak loud and all that. We don't um, tell them what to say or like that. We just, you know, read the story back to them and say, is this your story? And if they tell additional things, we get the police to get that and disclose it to the defense um, before um, the trial or like that. So. Um, that's normally what um, I think the assistant, the extent of the assistant we give during first meet and greet is getting them to, you know, feel comfortable and preparing them, you know, what to expect during the trial and all that um, court processes and, and all that. Um, I hope um, it answered the question. Can I give the floor back to Kati? Was was um some of what you raised addressed with some of the responses? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank thank you, Sasai. Mm -hmm. Um because my uh, I raised about the implementation, the what we have in plan the idea of forming a task force you think that is necessary or how do you go about making sure that everyone are on the same page i'm talking about the stakeholder thank you Um, I think uh, for us um, we normally when we do example for our review we not only invite uh, the participants is a mixture, we invite other stakeholders as well to attend the reviews um, as well so that they are also aware on what, you know, the policies that we have and, and the work that we do and what assistance we will be needing from them. So like we include um, other stakeholders as well um, so that um, we work together um, and they can also contribute to um, how they will help us as well in uh, implementing the guideline. I think like for us, it's we are so fortunate that our um, other stakeholders, they are like willing to help us. And we like, especially the social, um, the counselors, when we ask them, they're like, you know, always uh, keen to come and assist us, I think. Um, because you mentioned um, when you ask, um, you know, some of the counselors they raise um, certified and you know they have to be certified and all that. Um, for us, um, that's I think one of the positive about um, uh, uh, implementation um, by including other stakeholders as well. Um, yeah, hello. And also, we do some awareness during the court circuit on the work we do. And yeah, and, and to schools, we do some awareness to schools too, and uh, tell them about our work. So like everybody's aware of what we, not everybody, but people are aware on what we're doing. Yeah, thank you, Letty and um and Helen.
Um, Katsi, I think perhaps um, before Paula might want to uh, respond as well, um, there were some videos that were shared, and I think I recall very well that at the workshop, there were also pamphlets and brochures that were shared as well. And um, and with those materials, um, we're very happy to send them over to you, Katsi. So you can, um, you know, you can contextualize it. I think we have them also in e-copy, Word, in Word copy. So it will be um, a lot more accessible for you to, to have a look at and perhaps contextualize if you want. But I think this is uh, something also we would like, uh, we can share um, with the um, approval of um, the Solomon Islands Office of the Public Prosecution that their materials be sent over. But I think also, um, I'm not sure, Paula, do you want to add? as well. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add on to uh, what uh, my colleague Ellen and Letty mentioned on uh, getting the, uh, the st stakeholders uh, together. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, you can enter them uh, 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 to an MOU, like uh, Ellen mm -hmm. mentioned, a memorandum of understanding. And uh, as well as um, you can also, there was, a, we did one, um, I think it was a year or two ago, where we invited uh, the relevant stakeholders who are also working in that space of uh, victims to come together, mm -hmm. like the hospital, the Ronald Women's Center, mm -hmm. um, the uh, hospital, mind care, uh, even the doctor that uh, examines the victims when they're called in to for for the medical report so we we call all of them to come in the the purpose of that was to understand what each agencies uh, do uh where they come in and where they stop and where another comes in and takes over so that it would prevent uh it, the purpose was to ensure that we do not duplicate stuff but we mm -hmm. um we work collaboratively so that we can assist uh, victims uh, uh, better when we understand what each agency is do and what you can do and what you cannot and what the other can come in and can assist you. Um, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, to share that. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paula. Oh, thank you very much. I think um, the responses and the answers that we were provided today also very useful to our other members who are actually also listening. I know that the Giribas, um, our colleagues from Giribas also uh, sent some uh, questions right in the beginning of um, when we finished the workshop. And I shall now give the floor to other members of, um, of our webinar, uh, members who are listening in to ask a question. You know, you're more welcome to, um, you know, any comments is um, appreciated. Tarai? Um, while we're waiting for um members of the audience um to To ask any question, I have a question here. Um, it's been written. Um, I think um to you, Paula. You mentioned um you have offices in Tana and also Santo. Do you have the same issues as mentioned in the Solomon Islands, where you have you take those kits, um, you know, when it comes to special measures, or uh, is it different? Mm -hmm. I think maybe this question should be addressed to then to Letiara, Letiara and Helen. Letiara and Helen, what are the, the, the those um kits that you take over that you don't have in your other islands? Mm -hmm. Will those be partitions or? Mm -hmm. Um yes, so um during seconds because um normally some of the places we mm -hmm. go to doesn't have a network connection, so we um mostly apply for screening of the accused person. So um, the kit that we have normally has a white cloth uh, with pins, ropes, so that, you know, when we go make that application, we use that to make those, um, just to block the, 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 the witness from seeing the, the accused. So that's basically the standard um, 
um, materials in the kit. Yes, and yeah, curtains. And sometimes mm -hmm. we also include coloring books, uh, crayons and stuff like that for the kids as well during um, you know, conferencing and when we're meeting with them. So a doll, mm -hmm. um, teddy bears like that. So that's basically what um, we include in the kit and for prosecutors to take with them to seconds and also for our provincial office as well. Um, yes, yeah, so one of the um, resolution as well is that because we only have this uh, picking in a room, it's only here in our office uh, in Honiara. So one of the resolution as well, where we are creating the same for our provincial office as well. So that's one of the step, um, next step that we're doing as well, so that it's um, consistent as well with our provincial office. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah. I, I have another, I have one other question. Um, uh, what about language? When you go to those to do, and for children, they speak a different dialect. Do you have any issues with that? Yes, so <laughs> during seconds, we experience, uh, you know, of uh, course, sometimes it's the first time that we meet those uh, children. So like sometimes we've been, we ask them, are you confident with this? speaking in pidgin or sometimes they say no i want to speak in my language so before the trial we will inform the courts or we need an interpreter so then defense counsel and prosecutors will then you know agree on who, who will be the person to you know come in and uh, interpret so that um, the witness can tell his or her story in a language that um, he or she is comfortable with so that's also, um, we experienced that as well during seconds or even um, trials here in um, the capital as well that we have to use interpreters to come and assist um, the witnesses um, when they give the evidence. So, yes. And I think that's the same with Paul as well, where you have several languages that are used. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, so uh, it's the same with Solomon Islands. Uh, Vanuatu is made of 83 islands altogether, six provinces. So there's a um, lot of different languages used. I think the com most common one is Bislama. Uh, we try to use, um, uh, translate all information as much as possible to Bislama. Uh, in instances where a uh, victim is, uh, especially here in uh, in in the capital, um, where a victim requires translation is when if if uh, doesn't speak Islam but the uh, its own dialogue, then it's uh, uh, the prosecutor would make uh, the uh, um, the arrangements to find someone that speaks in that language to attend court and as well as if, if the judge is uh does not speak islama uh, if, if, if the judge is a palangi then the, there will be a, a translator that translates um for 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 the victim who speaks islama so in english to islama and uh, vice versa uh, yeah uh, thank you chair I need to add on, uh, sometimes when we meet, it, you know, during the first meet and greet and also when uh, reassessing the vulnerable risk assessment, that's one of the things that we include as well, you know, finding out that, oh, this witness cannot speak fluent pidgin and not that, so we'll note that down and that's when we'll inform our witness support, support officer that, okay, for trial we'll be needing an interpreter. So we normally use, um, for conferencing, a separate person and then for trial, it's either we look for it or the courts, we have an interpreter's uh, unit in the courts that where they can also assist to look for interpreters as well. So that also comes back to the importance of, you know, filling in the risk assessment, getting, you know, to meet and greet at the first in, uh, instance so that these issues can be addressed before um, the trial. And it helps mm -hmm. us as well here. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. We have a question here from Tarai. Um, I've asked her, Tarai, you can um, ask your question. Um, yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, our question 
uh, from the AGIS office, Kiribes, is um, in regards to the implementation as well. Um, we have included the um, the WSO in our Family Peace Act, uh, the amendment, before the upcoming um, uh, parliament to, so that uh, the witness support officer is recognized. And now we just want to know um, what are the procedures to request um, technical assistance uh, for a TA to visit um, Kirves and conduct uh, a proper training to <clears throat> to uh, us to, to help us um, implement the the guideline. Um, we maybe we we can ask Helen to come and. <laughs> Come on, Tara, right? We want to see your face. <laughs> come on. Hello. Oh, Helen, to come over, we want to see you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, now that you, you, you've seen us from the ages, <laughs> and one can, um, especially those who have just implemented the um, guidelines. We're very interested to know um what are the measures you took to um to start your implementation that can assist us as well. Okay. okay. Um, thank you, Tara. Oh, it's lovely to see you and, and your colleague. Um, I think with your question, it's uh, very important. And I think that's why we've um set up our our mentoring pilot. Um, and um, we've actually started with RMI. Um, they've actually um, sent some questions. So in this mentoring pro uh, pilot, we're going to be um, setting up um, schedules. Um, you can um, send your questions to us, and then we can partner you up um, with an advisory panel member and, and go through some of the issues uh, you're going through at the first stages of the implementation of uh, this uh, pilot. And um, I think the trainers that can come at the end, but I think with this pilot, it would allow us to collect data and um, to find out, you know, exactly what your needs are. And, and we can even group it with the needs of other jurisdictions. And um, I'll give the floor to Chase. Chase, would you like to comment? But um, the secretariat, we're now, um, we will be the administrator of this pilot. So you just have to register. And then um, we will be scheduling scheduling some uh, virtual meetings with um, with members of the advisory panel uh, panel, and then together we can uh, provide initial advice, and we can also together agree on an estimated time, and plan for engagement, and we'll go from there. I'll give the floor to um, Chase. Chase, are you there? Would you like to um, comment further? Mm -hmm. But thank you, Tarai, for that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. I, I have nothing to add. Um, I just think that all of this sharing and questions and the questions being answered by the advisory mm -hmm. panel is amazing. And that's why we're um, starting this mentorship program. So it will basically be like this, just a slightly smaller group. Um, and you'll have the chance to ask the advisory panel based on their experiences, um, really any questions that you have um, from wherever you're up to. I think you covered it very well, Chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Chase. Um, right. Uh, I think the question you asked, Tarai, also um, is really relevant to also what um, Kati was, was also um, asking. Amanda, do you have any comments? We can give you the last. Um, we've only got about five minutes left, so I thought we would like to hear from you. Amanda was one of our speakers. Um, diligent speaker in our workshop in Nandi, and we're very happy to have her on board. Mm. Thank you, Chair. It's it's an absolute pleasure to see all of your faces again. Um, <clears throat> I'm really impressed by all of the diligence and hard work that's going on here. It's it's amazing. Um, just hearing the the workarounds that are going on and the adaptations that are being made, I think it's um, it's really important work that's being done, and uh, I just want to commend everyone for their their commitment and their enthusiasm, and their willingness to share. You know, it's it's great to have that feeling that everyone's 
all on board on the same page and just willing to make things work. So um, it's an honour to see it all happening and unfolding. It's quite exciting. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there. I, I'm just cognizant that Stella has a question. Hi. Hello, Stella. Um, you can hear me. Very well. Very well. All right. So first of all, just um, thank you for sharing such great practices, um, especially um, the part where there's clear functions of stakeholders and um, uh, the clear steps in the procedure, a great support system. That's all great to hear um, since um, we're still in the process of initiating the implementation of the guidelines here in Nauru. Um, just one of um, uh, just one question or a couple of questions, but I'll just ask the one right now. So what would be one of the main indicators that um, by implementing the guide in your countries is being addressed more effectively? Um, like, for example, like statistics, like there's more reporting, more cases being resolved, or I don't know how to measure this, but perpetrator behavior change which um, uh, likely is leading to a decrease in SGBV. So I, I guess I'm more interested in the um, key indicators like in that monitoring and evaluation of the implementation. Um, does anyone like to um, respond? I have no idea. <laughs> Um, I give the floor to um, to ladies uh, from the Solomon Islands. Mm. Stella, yes. I think uh, with your question, we can also, uh, what I've done, I've taken some notes on your question. Perhaps um, from the Secretariat, we can provide a more um, comprehensive and a better response to your question. And I think it's really important because um, it actually, you know, paves the way for the work and, and the processes that we're doing. And um, if there's no one that can provide an answer, we will be very happy to um, give you a response and copy the, you know, the ones that actually were in this um, forum. Mm. Mm. So Chase, do you, um, do you want to make a comment? And ladies, Aleti and Helen? Sorry, I, um, I, I didn't hear the question um, uh, really well. I think it's uh, down network. I apologize, so it's yeah. distorted. Mm. If, if the question can be repeated, thank you. Mm. Sure. Um, well, I can just write it um, down and perhaps people, but I'll just repeat it. Um, I was just asking about the main key, oh, the, one of the key indicators or main indicators that um, by implementing the that shows that SGBV is being addressed more effectively um, through that. Um, for example, like statistics, like more reporting, um, more cases being resolved, or perhaps perpetrator behavior change, if that can be measured, how is that be leading um, to a decrease in SGBV? Um, thank you. How, how is, is it um, impact access to justice? I guess. Um, I guess I might miss some parts, but um, I think I. Uh, you mentioned something about key indicators. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so for us, what we see, you know, when after implementing this um, guideline and the practices, we see that um, there's, because uh, I think one of the indicators is, you know, helping assisting witnesses to give the best evidence in court and all that. So one of the indicators is we get um, 
we see that compliance, you know, when we go through the process practices in the guideline, we see um, that witnesses, they are, you know, confident and they, they were able to, you know, tell their story in court. And it also um, result in high level of conviction rate as well here um, in, in Solomon Islands as well. And also in relation to victim impact statement, there's an increase in the penalty being imposed by judges as well. And all that. So I think um, some that's some of the um, indicators. And also because um, during the first meeting, could we refer beginning to refer our witnesses for counseling to assist them with trauma, and also it you know helps them mm -hmm. as well and prepare them well compared to when before we were uh, we didn't um, have these practices in place. We struggled, you know, victims standing hostile or they don't want because you know that's the first time they meet the prosecutor. You know, they don't want to tell, going back and tell their story or like that. So that's those are some of the um, indicators we, we see from by implementing um, these practices. It um, helps us in disposing our cases um, successfully um, by way of conviction. Um, I think that's um, from yeah. our experience here. And so... Thank you, Letty. Yeah, um, thank you. I think I would like to just um, quickly provide a uh, an answer from the Secretariat. When we first started um, drafting and planning the regional guideline, we had a questionnaire that went out to all our members. And in this questionnaire, there was um, a very validated indicator that came out. Of, there was an increase in reporting of um, of um, sexual related um, stories that were coming to the police. And there was also an increase of women coming forward to tell their story. There was also um, a lot of, um, we, we, it also was very relevant. It correlates with the no drop policy that uh, the police for the case of Samoa are now mandated. So the no drop policy has been um, now in operation. And and it's um and that was one of the indicators um is um to ensure that you know to encourage women to 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 come forward, and um and that was reported as one of the prevalent indi indicators of one reason why um our guideline also um you know was actually planned, and as I've said earlier, I really um love your question, Stella, because um that kind of question also it allows the secretariat to to even come back and um to our members and and inform of of why we um we you know the reasons why we we stuck to this um project that we did and we would like to see it through as much as possible while we're still you know in in these uh, positions that we hold at the moment but um ladies and gentlemen um we we're running out of time um it's now an hour and a half more than that that we've been um uh, in, in you know engage and with uh, our discussions and I must say that this is one of the most beneficial discussion and first one of its kind that we've had and it's very important for us because we're now dealing directly with everyone that's involved with the implementation of the guideline and um and I would like to thank um Dr. AJ especially our speaker I'll give you the you know, thank you very much for your very insightful contributions and your feedback and uh, they're very useful and inspires us to do more and be relevant and focused. But I also take this floor to especially thank our uh, panel speakers today. Um, uh, you know, Chief, Chief Prosecutor, Assistant Attorney General of RMI, uh, Mr. Kati Wase, and also we have um, Litiara from um, the Solomon Islands, uh, Bailey from the Solomon Islands, and also Paula from Vanuatu. And last and not least, we have um, Helen Bennett, our witness support officer, also from Solomon Islands. Thank you very much for your contributions. And thank you also for championing this course. It's very important to us that we held on high. And um, and that, as I said before, and as um, Amanda has said, you know, we we really want to aspire to do better and be and be good in the jobs that we do. And as Paula has added, you know, this is our, uh, what we do is, you know, it, it's very ethical, the work that we do. And um, we do it with love and justice that the people that we set up to protect the vulnerable witnesses that we hold dear and the work that we do is, um, is something that we are more responsible to do. And uh, may I take this opportunity to thank also Australia Chase and uh, Sophie 
everyone who um taking the time to join from Kiribati and also Nauru, um, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, RMI, um, Australia, Samoa, Fiji. Uh, if I haven't missed you, I'm very sorry, but we've got very few minutes. Thank you again. Thank you for joining us and wish you well. And may you have a very pleasant weekend, very restful weekend. Mm. So far, so far. Bye. Thank you.